My name's Jake Short. I'm an Associate Professor and a Consultant Haematologist at Monash Health and Monash University, where I have a research lab that's um, involved in discovering and testing new treatments for lymphoma. And I also see patients and um, put them on clinical trials, uh, all in the same uh, line of work. I'm very lucky, I love my job and I, I really find all elements of blood cancer interesting. Um, it's a fascinating area that's moving ahead very quickly. Uh, but what I'm really interested in is the, uh, the area of lymphoid cancer, which includes lymphoma and, and myeloma. Um, it, it's a common disease, uh, there's many different varieties of it and very exciting developments and treatments. So non-Hodgkin lymphoma encompasses more than 70 different diseases, so it's a fairly um, large group of related diseases, and what relates them together is they're all cancers of the immune system and a particular part of the immune system called the, called the lymphocyte. Um, so all the different kinds of non-Hodgkin lymphoma arise from uh, different stages of lymphocyte development. Hodgkin lymphoma is broadly classified into B and T cell disease, which arises from B or T lymphocytes, um, and then also classified as either indolent or slow growing or aggressive and fast going, uh, growing. Uh, and so I think it's important for people to know what particular kind of non Hodgkin lymphoma they have because if they talk to someone else who says they've got non Hodgkin lymphoma, they, they may think they've got the same disease and be looking at similar prognoses and treatments, but actually they could have something very different. That's an interesting question, um, and often uh, the word cancer comes up, we're referring to this as a blood cancer. Cancers, I suppose, to me, uh, if you're thinking in lay terms, are, are malignant or aggressive. Um, Non-Hodgkin lymphoma can be malignant and aggressive, and I think then cancer really is an appropriate word, or it can be very indolent and slow growing, and you can live with it for many years without any symptoms or problems. And in that case, I think it's benign, and cancer's probably not quite the right connotation. And I think that's an important concept, because in the same consultation with a patient, you might be telling them that they have a lymphoma, and on very simple terms, they think they've got a cancer, but because it's not doing any harm, you tell them you're not going to treat it. And that's almost a bit of a paradox to, to think about when you face it for the first time. So that's a, that's a really difficult question to answer for good re the good reason that, that there's been a lot of breakthroughs, and so it's hard to really rank them. Um, I think the single biggest thing, the paradigm shift that we're observing at the moment is around immunotherapy. The advent to that was probably more than a decade ago with the um, introduction of rituximab to standard chemotherapy and B-cell lymphoma, but now we're seeing even cleverer immune therapies that can um, uncloak the uh, lymphoma and make it visible to the immune system. Um, and. Uh, this is a very exciting um, development because I think the power of the immune system could be unlocked to improve cure rates in patients, for example, where chemotherapy isn't working. Um, and then in the same um, path of development, uh, there's uh, the advent of CAR T cells, chimeric antigen receptor T cells. This is an even newer development, genetically engineered T cells that are designed to kill lymphoma. Um, those, that general field of cancer immunotherapy it would be the biggest, the biggest one, I'd say. I think in general, the next breakthroughs will be at the interface that integrates the new treatments, whether they be immunotherapies, small molecules, or epigenetic drugs, with the concept of precision medicine, where we take an individual patient's lymphoma and uh, dissect out the genes and the mutations that make that particular lymphoma tick 
and bring that information with the best pot of possible drugs. So precision medicine, personalized medicine, I think will be the way of the future. Accessing the information again would be through uh, credible peer-reviewed sources and, and foundations such as the Leukemia Foundation. Um, accessing treatments depends on whether your um, clinician um, is aware of the treatments and I think it's important to ensure that the clinician you're engaging practices in a peer-reviewed environment because um, as an individual, even though lymphoma is the thing that really interests me, I can't hope to keep up with all of it. So I rely on my peers to, to, to get information from them. They might have been to a conference more recently than I have or read a paper. So having a, having a doctor that's engaged with the academic community um, is part potentially of a, of a bigger organisation or, or um, association or foundation will ensure that they're, um, no matter how good a doctor they are, they're not sort of working in isolation. I think that's really important. And, and in, our, in our own clinics, oftentimes we make the big treatment decisions and diagnostic decisions in the context of a multidisciplinary team meeting. And that's a really good way of ensuring that um, there's a few brains in the room working on the same problem. Two most common questions. The first one is, why did I get this? What causes it? And in lymphoma, there isn't an easy answer to that because it's not like smoking and, and, and lung cancer or UV light and melanoma. Probably, for want of a better explanation, it's largely bad luck. Um, the second thing that people ask, it, um, and it may be to do with the cultural demographic that, that often comes to our clinics, is what food should I eat? Um, and should I take vitamins or supplements to help to help with my lymphoma? And generally the answer to that is there's no food or lifestyle modification that, that's particularly relevant, but you want to just stay fit and healthy. Um, and, and if you're having chemotherapy, avoid leftovers and things like that that could give you food poisoning. So more of a common sense sort of approach. My main message would be um, it's a tough battle and everyone has their own journey. Um, the field is moving so quickly at the moment. It's so exciting um, that the discussions we're having about lymphoma now are going to be different from the ones we're having next year and problems that are, seem insurmountable at the moment as we move forward will become much more manageable. So I think there's a lot of hope um, and, and I think that um, people need to be aware that there's a lot of effort from both academics, uh, industry and, and their own doctors to, to try and find better treatments and we're, and we're finding them all the time. It's really important because if patients understand it, they know um, the challenges that they might be facing and they know why they might um, need to take treatments that may, might make them feel unwell before they get better, but also realise that it could potentially be you know, a manageable problem and, and, a, and approach it in a really positive way. The importance of going to places like the Leukaemia Foundation is that for your, for your information, um, is that it's a credible source, the information is of high quality and you won't be given misleading facts. Unfortunately, if you start plugging your diagnosis into Google, you can be led astray at best, but at worst, there'll be people and organisations out there that will want to profit from your misfortune and you have to be very careful to stay away from the snake oil salesman and keep your information sources valid and um, uh, and, and then you'll, they'll be helpful.